Alex. Hi. Thanks for agreeing to chat about your experience with Flipside Studio. Oh, no worries, man. Anytime. And I know I've been following you since Dignation, and um, I've kind of known your work and, and what you've been doing in your career, but maybe some people who are seeing us for the first time don't know about you. Yep. So can you talk a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I started in um, the entertainment industry back in the heady, heady 2000s, um, which totally dates me, but you know what are you going to do? Uh, I came out uh, here as a computer science guy. I actually have a computer science degree. And came out and worked uh, at the Rand Corporation, which is like a nonprofit research organization, and was always doing improv comedy. And I really loved this uh, TV uh, channel called Tech TV back in the day. Um, I used to watch uh, Leah Laporte and uh, Patrick Norton and that gang over there um, <clears throat> on the show called The Screensavers. And I was always intrigued by it because it was uh, a live, hour long, daily tech show. So I was like, God, who who else? Like, this is the perfect show for me to host. I have improv background and a computer science degree. Where do I sign? Um, and randomly, as as fate would have it, because there's got to be a little bit of fate in these things, I was at a wedding. Uh, a friend of uh, my wife's uh, was getting married, and I went. And one of the things that they did was they said this, like, "Oh, you might not know this about the the wedding party." And one of them was. Oh, she she's a producer on the Man Show for Geeks, and so I went. I, I'm sure I watched that show. What is this show? So I go up to her and I was like, "Oh, what's the Man Show for Geeks?" And it turned out it was Unscrewed with Martin Sargent, which was also on Tech TV. And I was like, "Oh my God, Tech TV! I love Tech TV, computer science, improv. I've always wanted to host, but I'm in LA. I don't want to move to San Francisco." And she goes, "Oh yeah, we just got bought by G4. We're going to merge the two companies, and they're moving everybody down from San Francisco. And one of the hosts of the Screensavers is not moving." We're doing auditions right now. You should you should audition. And I was like, okay. Uh, so three weeks later, I'm the current co-host of the Screensavers on uh, G4 Tech TV with uh, my buddy Kevin Rose. Um, through that, Kevin, uh, while we were there, created a, a website called Dig.com, which was like an OG Reddit type vibe. You know, early early Web 2.0 days, and. Uh, and after about six months, um, we ended up creating the podcast Ignition, which ran for seven and a half years. And then from there, created and produced and host a bunch of different uh, content for Revision 3, as well as other companies. And so I've been doing internet video productions for a long time, and then also uh, dabbling in, in hosting still. I hosted BlizzCon for Blizzard Entertainment for many, many, many years, um, as well as directed feature films and commercials and produced other people's films and commercials and just been an all around fan of, of uh, uh, production and entertainment industry. And, and then a buddy of mine started a website uh, called caffeine.tv, which is a, an app that uh, is a, um, a live social experience app. Um, and I was an advisor for the company for, for many years. And then when they created a joint venture, uh, uh, streaming studio with uh, 20th Century Fox, or Fox, I should say, New Fox. Um, I always call it the uh, $74 billion Fox. So not the stuff they <laughs> sold to Disney, the banks that they kept. Uh, uh, I came on full-time and, and oversaw um, original productions, and we had three original productions that I that I created and oversaw, and then I took over as head of production uh, writ large, and so I'm overseeing everything that Caffeine is producing in-house. That is a long-winded way of saying hi. Hey, that's a great, it's a great way. It's a great way. I'm, I love, I love that you you brought up uh, the Martin Sargents and the screensavers. And, yeah. Because I remember, um, so uh, so I grew up in a small rural town. We had th we called it Peasant Vision. We got three channels. Amazing. And so when I moved to Winnipeg, the big city, we got some cable TV, and I'm like, what's this thing called? Yep. Screensavers yeah blew my mind completely and um and i i think we have our we're kindred spirit so i yeah. i kind of followed i followed uh i followed a lot of the work you did and i watched the dignation stuff and you guys were way ahead of the game on the podcast side of things right? oh yeah yeah i mean honestly the reason why it started was week so leo had started twit which was the uh, this week in tech podcast and it was podcasting back then was really i mean now it's just like podcasts are ubiquitous but back in the day you actually, they're called podcasts because you literally would 
cast it overnight using RSS feeds to your iPod. And literally you would plug in your iPod overnight and let it download these basically radio shows. And so it was really hard to do. You had to get these special software. You had to kind of like find out where to get the RSS feeds. It was, it was not great. We always called it like the ham radio days, right? Like it was all these like old wizened white guys that were like, wow, well, if you turn the frequency, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right, right. I went to like some of the early podcast ex expos and it was like, wow, that's really fun. Um, and iTunes was the big mover. That was what really changed it all for, for everybody. And for us, I mean, I got a call from Kevin this was probably six, seven months after we'd stopped doing the screensavers together, but I got a call from him and he said, iTunes just announced that they're going to release podcasting as a feature in iTunes, which now is like, pff, who cares? But back in the day, that was massive. It was like, oh, all of a sudden you're going to be up there with iTunes music. Like, um, I don't even think they started selling episodes of TV yet. It was like music. Um, and I was like, he was like, I want to do one. I, I want to do one for dig because he was the ceo of founder of that site and i was like yeah let's do it man this sounds fun which was super cool and how we ended up meeting is um so we i ended up meeting anna sweet who's a mutual colleague of ours uh yeah. when when we were down at our accelerator and she we were going for coffee one day and she's well i have this friend you know alex albrecht and i'm like i have i don't know him but i know him and yeah. then um we got a chance to you know we we met over uh, uh, some starbucks starbucks uh, baby and we just started dreaming about the future which yeah which was really cool and so one of the things that we ended up doing is or your, your team actually really executed a very ambitious project called still, live i still can't believe we did it <laughs> I, I i don't i can't believe we did it either um, it's called Live from the Eighth Dimension, and mm -hmm. it was a, uh, it, it, and sadly it was, but it, it is, it, it was a, it had a good 48 episode run or 42 mm -hmm. episode run. It was an hour long, you know, mocap animation show that you produced live and you had pre recorded mm -hmm. content. And one of the questions I was, I want to talk to you about around that is what were some of the big challenges? that you found yourselves having working with this new mocap animation technology? Yeah, it's really funny, man. I remember having coffee with you and I think you invited me to like the beta or something. I popped on my headset because I, I, you know, it's just a tech fan. I have like all the headsets from VR, you know what I mean? And, uh, and it was really crazy because I always knew that this technology could really, really get rid of the barrier to entry for for animation and for and for mocap specifically. Um, you know, animation is very expensive and very time consuming, right? And I, I love animation. I've been a fan of it all my life, obviously. Um, and I remember when we we met, I was like trying to get my brain around it because it's such a it's such an a very specific yet completely open-ended system that you guys have created, right? Like, I know what it's like because it comes from, a, I come from television studios and live, right? So I understand teleprompters, I understand multiple cameras and tally lights and all of this stuff that as, as a, a host and a, and a producer, all that goes into doing a live uh, television show. Um, and at the same time, because it's based on a game engine, you can literally do anything that you want. If you can imagine it, you can do it. And so, so for us, I think one of the big challenges was we saw the opportunity. I was put into a position where I was creating um, shows for a live streaming service, right? So it wasn't like we were being asked to make purely linear narrative uh, uh, animation. Um, because I think you can do that really well with your product, but I don't know why you like how you would make the jump to using the product because the live aspect made it so that we could justify the interactivity um, through through what we were doing at caffeine and really in, in instigating uh, real time communication in inside the uh, uh, entertainment content. But one of the challenges that we had was convincing people that it was doable, right? Like every single person I hired was like, I don't understand what you're asking me to do. <laughs> and it was like, 
I don't know what I'm asking you to do. I just, this is, this is a thing and we're going to make a thing. And, you know, I mean, you think about it, like you ask an animation writer to say, we're going to do an hour long, an hour of animated content a week. And they go, holy crap, that is so much content because they're thinking of like, you know, I mean, if it's like an adult swim show, you're writing 10 minutes, you know what I mean? Per episode, right? Like 22 minutes is basically the most anybody makes of animated content. And they take months and months and months to generate that. And here we are going, no, we're going to do an hour and we're going to do it every week. And also we don't know how we're going to make it work. I mean, it was just like, but there was something really cool about it because there were these milestones like, um, First off, we just set up the VR stuff. We, we hired Mike Shaw, who was fantastic um, showrunner, executive producer, um, and director of, of a lot of the episodes, the majority of them. Um, and I remember having these conversations with him where we were just like, I don't know. I don't know. Do you just, just give it a shot? Just try it out. You know what I mean? And we really locked into, we did our first, like, I wasn't even there. It was uh, uh, Vinny, who's my head of production, uh, uh, Mike Shaw, who ran the show and uh, Bea, who runs one of our other uh, content verticals for us. And they were just in the office late night and they were like, you know what, let's just try to record something. And so it was like, I think it was like the, the, the like salad. One of them was the salamander guy. One of them was uh liney stick line, which we, we now call him cause he did, did a couple episodes for us, which was like the stick figure guy you guys have. And then it was a uh, uh, robot Kyle. It was the uh, uh, unity robot free robot. And they just shot this little thing where they just sort of said, hey, they were just like, hey, guys, what's going on? And I came in the next day and they said, we shot something last night. And I was like, OK. And I watched it and I was like, this is amazing. This is hysterical. Like, it clearly was improvised. <laughs> it was clearly just three people punchy at work. But it was un undeniably engaging. I mean, it was just like, it was there. It was like, it was this great moment where I was like, okay, okay, this is gonna. And then the real big challenge for us was, how do you tell a story if you have to do it all live? Now, I will say this. One of my personal favorite episodes was my dinner with Kyle or my dinner with Amy, which was literally a knockoff of my dinner with Andre. And it was, if you go back and watch that hour long episode, they were live for an hour. They did that like a play. And, and that to me was like, oh my God, because it was always sort of like hot. We can't fill in like get an hour in VR is even fatiguing. Like, how do you do this? And, and so, so we, we then sort of cracked the nut of like, okay, we're going to do the mocap stuff uh, that we're going to pre-shoot. Those are going to be sort of like our ABC story arcs, you know, act one, two, three. And then in between, we're going to have these live moments where we get to interact live. And another one of the big aha moments was, you know, we had a big production studio. You know, the other thing is we were pushing those things hard. Like we had five, five sessions of uh, uh, VR going every single week. You know, the director, the three actors, you know, somebody in there moving sets and cameras. I mean, it was just it was nuts. Um, but we, we had this audio guy and, and, and uh, I remember being in the control room and what we would do is we would use sort of standard television production stuff uh, like a, a video switcher to roll in the intro animation and, and you know, logo stuff that's sort of credits and then cut between the live and the, and the pre-tape and all that stuff. And one of our first tests, we were in the control room and we cut to a pre-tape from live. And I, w I was hearing the audio from the actors just sitting in the other room, like waiting to go live again. And so I go, I go, hey, uh, can you cut the, cut the live, like cut the live audio? And the guy was like, what? And I was like, their microphones are hot. And he goes, yeah. And I go, cut, cut, cut the thing. And he comes into the control room and he's like, what, 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 what? And I go, this is pre-taped. Like I can hear the actors of the thing. And he goes, that's not live. And I was like, oh, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. This can work. We convinced our audio engineer that we were live, even though it was pre-taped. So, you know, I think, honestly, the, big, the biggest challenge was um, 
getting getting people to understand what it was we were asking them to do and how to do it. I mean, nobody knew how to do any of it. So it was like, and you know, as we got along, the other thing that was really great working with with you guys and, and your team is, you know, we would learn things or not learn things is the wrong way to put it. We would feel pain points that most users wouldn't feel because of how much we were really putting the thing through its pace. I mean, we, we you know, we did everything that it was designed for at, at every split second of the day. I mean, it wasn't, there was no feature that we weren't using extensively. And it was really great because our team would then work with you guys and say, hey, this would be a big lifesaver for us. And, you know, that to us was really, really helpful. Um, being able to see the software evolve, but also to be able to say, hey, as a person who's just using this, I mean, we were using it 40 hours a week. You know what I mean? Like those guys were in there all the time uh, putting it through its paces. So you were, you were, <clears throat> your team was definitely blowing our team's mind. And um, <laughs> I it was like, know. it was like power beta testing. You know <laughs> it, what I mean? was, it was, it was beyond power beta testing. It was like, I remember the, my, one of my, scarier moments in in uh because in the first about first 10 or 15 episodes we we made sure we were there watching every single minute of it because yep. we were learning so much from from your team but i remember the it was a it was a holiday episode and there was a santa claus with like four million polygon beard oh yes <laughs> just the beard yeah <laughs> it didn't crash but I no no there was it was a little little choppy it and got we a couldn't little... figure it out and then it was like oh santa is the most expensive asset you can have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, da Daz assets have a way of doing yeah. beards that were just like, whoa. But yeah. but it was like those kinds of discoveries. So, I mean, for us, we've just cherished the opportunity to, to be able to collaborate that way. And yeah. so that was cool. It was like, it was a definitely a spirit of adventure in, in the process. Yeah. So, so that was super cool on our side. And so obviously you talked a little bit earlier about, you know, how long it takes to do an hour's worth of animated content and how much, how, how you were really yeah. actually inventing a new process and really reducing mm -hmm. that. Was that the main benefit for you or what was the main benefits for you for using mo motion okay. capture versus, versus traditional? Yeah. I will say this, there is, so perfect example. Uh, we are, our, our main character, Amy, um, uh, Amy Vorpal, amazing talented actress she tends to crack up a lot there is nothing more charming than seeing an animated character genuinely losing it because of something somebody said that does not exist right perfect example is if you see um uh, a bug's life at the end of A Bug's Life, Pixar does this, and they do this periodically. A lot of the animated movies do this, where they do fake bloopers. And they're cute, but they are very much genuinely not realistic. Like, you don't buy that any of that happened. We had bloopers. Like, we literally had bloopers, and it was so amazing. But you can get this true improvisational moments and other animated uh, things do that where you're doing the voices, but you can't do physical visual gags, right? Like there were times when Roach would make a visual gag that was improvised, whether it was the slow turning to Amy when she says something, you know what I mean? And you just, you, you can't get that kind of improv, you, you know, especially... You know, and you can do a lot with animation, right? I mean, it, it, it can have a lot of life in it. I mean, like, oh, God, look at all the Miyazaki stuff. Like, you can add this insane amount of spirit and life into it. But when you're doing this mocap stuff live, there's just nothing like having a character, seeing the other character in real time, like how the character would look in that space, being physically in the space, picking up a prop and making a joke, throwing something because you're angry like you just can't do this stuff outside of 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 the software that you guys have built and outside this mocap concept of of animation so it really afforded us the opportunity to you know the other thing is you can experiment you can take you know do 10 bad takes you know what i mean whereas you're never going to animate 10 bad takes <laughs> you know what i mean you're going to cut together the audio you're going to put the little like you know 
like line Poses drawings. And yeah, and then you're going to be like, and... yeah, that's that feels right. Now go take six months to make this. You know what I mean? So it unless really you're into that. Tor- unless you're into torturing yourself and you want to <laughs> animate yeah. nine nine bad takes. Um, how about the writing process? Did you bring any of the, uh, did you do any of the improvised, was there improvisation in the writing or did you follow out more of a television style of writing or? So the writing was interesting, right? Because again, we had to sort of convince the, these television writers that they were writing for something that was a little bit different. And, and it took a while for them to figure out their voice. And, and it really did get to this point where they were able to understand that they were they were writing for the characters and then they would get into the into the show and into the pre-tapes and and even onto the live show like there were questions that they'd sort of said there was sort of like a gag not gag is wrong but there was like a story to the character that was being interviewed and why um and the really funny thing is we started doing less of the interview stuff and more these like live pre like stuff that we would have pre-taped we're like well let's just do it live because it's so much more fun you know so we would have these like live scenes you know like at one point they went to like a security guard on the station and that was the scene they were interviewing the security guard and talking to the security guard about things so it wasn't really an interview it was like a scene where they go to the security guard but it was all improvised and um so the writers definitely got to the point where they were like oh this is great we can write you know so-and-so talks to chat i mean that was the other thing we had a whole section two whole sections where literally it was just our two main characters talking to the people that were watching the show answering questions chatting about things and and some of the stuff that became running gags all came from those chat things you know i remember at one point somebody was like don't go as a pumpkin for halloween that's so lame and then it became this whole gag where like Amy was going to go in Halloween as a pumpkin. And that was like the lamest thing that the audience could think of. And then we did a Halloween episode where her character was dressed as a pumpkin. And it's just like, you can't get that without that kind of interactivity. <clears throat> and also to be able to like flip it around so quick, right? You got this moment, oh, yeah. you know, like, oh, let's take advantage of that. One of the things yeah. I really love, there are two episodes that I just <laughs> totally cracked up over. And one of them was a Western episode where uh, I guess the, uh, Amy and Roach are coming into this, I guess they're going to a merchant or something. And it mm-hmm. looks like there's a crystal ball in the scene of some sort. Yep. And, and this other person is actually <laughs> looking to the crystal ball, but is actually looking at the chat. Yeah. And so it, the chat was like throwing all these little improvised moments and, yeah. and just, you could see this. And it felt like I was watching, uh, like, a, like, I felt like I was watching a pre-tape, but I could yeah. tell inside that moment that it wasn't. And um, yeah. another another episode that did this for me was there was a preacher improvisation episode where uh, they're doing uh, Amy's on the pulpit. And oh, she, yeah. She, she becomes improv- the cult leader. Yeah, and yeah. Becomes, and again, she's looking at this. You can tell she's looking at the chat. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so how, how did you, and I mean, I, I also see that fits with what caffeine brings, right? Like caffeine yeah. brings this like low latency, quick chat interaction. Yep. So how how did you um like how did you land on that where how did you discover this this nice blend yeah you know it really came out of the the thought challenge of loving narrative and then the the ability to have these um ultra low latency uh, interactions i mean our our tech allows uh our streams to be faster than the facetime call right so the thing, the thing that you're seeing amy say you can react to, and she can react right back um, in near real time. Uh, and that was a big differentiator for, for us as a company. And so some of the stuff that we did, like Live from the Eighth Dimension, it was really a big, um, uh, not proof of concept, but it was really like, it was, it was a flagship way of being like, this is how this works. And I remember our internet went out <laughs> right before we went live for the first time <clears throat> okay. at the studio. And it was spotty. And it was just weird. And it was like, we couldn't get it working. And there was sort of this other way to stream that we could maybe kind of like hobble, but it was like a lot of dropped frames and it added this like big, um, this big latency into it. And big for us is like 15 seconds. That's too much for us, right? And I remember I had the guys in the studio, we were live streaming on a test server and it was like six o'clock and we were going live or it was five o'clock and we were going live at six for the first episode 
and I go, and I go, just clap over there in the game. And so you just see the character go like this. And I hear it because he's literally, I can see him. He's right there. And I'm watching and watching and watching and watching and watching. And fine. And by the way, 10 seconds is way longer than you think when you're waiting to see how long it takes. Right. And then the character goes like this. And I was like, I, I'm not doing that. I, that. That's not the show. I can't do that. We ended up figuring out what to do. We ran a very long ethernet cable to the next door neighbor uh, who had good internet at the time. So problem solved, we, we went live, it was great. Um, but it really is that aha moment because not only is the latency impressive, right? Like I would do, when I would just like hop on and stream back early days just to sort of like test it out, people would come in and they'd be like, hey Alex, in chat and I'd be like, hey, what's up? And they were like, whoa. And I'm like, yeah, this is, yeah, we're just, 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 just a conversation. It's not like scrolling wall of garbage that's, you know, 60 seconds old. We're just chatting. But then you add in the fact that they're chatting with an animated character. I mean, that's just like the holy grail. I mean, people were, it, every week we'd have people come in that were like, what is, how is this even possible? And it's like, just buckle up and enjoy, man. It's, it's the way to go. It was a lot of fun to watch. I, I laughed many, many, many episodes. Um, I'm going to ask another question around, um, let's see. Um, so what made you choose, what made you choose Flipside Studio over some alternate technology? So it's interesting. I met with a bunch of people. Um, so I met with um, uh, one of the guys that runs Face Rig uh, back in the day. Uh, I met we, we looked at it. I can't even remember what the second software was we looked at. Um, honestly, after meeting you, I then went back and got to play with the software, right? And and I had this moment, because this is pre-me getting the job where I get to make this stuff happen. Um, and and post-meeting you, I had this moment playing Star Trek Bridge Commander. So we all got into VR and we're all playing Star Trek Bridge Commander. For those of you who don't know, it's basically Star Trek, shocker, um, where every all four people are in headsets in VR. One of them is, you know, engineering. One of them is like the science officer. One of them is, you know, weapons. And one of them is the captain. One of them's, you know, all this stuff. And the way that it starts is you all start in basically a conference room on the Enterprise or whatever ship it is. I don't think it was the Enterprise. I think it was a Star Trek ship, right? And you see the other players as representations of their of a character, right? And I was playing with three of my friends, and two of them had to like you know go do something. We basically were just waiting for everybody to muster so we could do it. And I was sitting opposite a buddy of mine, and I was just like, "So how's you know what's what's up? Like we're just I mean, what else we're gonna do?" So I was like, "How's how's things?" And he was a Vulcan science officer, right? So I'm like staring at this Vulcan science officer and he starts to tell me about his evening, the evening prior. And it was hysterical. I mean, I'm sitting here listening to this guy. He's like, well, you know, I was out at a bar, I met this girl, I don't know. But I'm seeing a Vulcan science officer in a Star Trek like conference room. And he's like hanging his head in his hands and doing all this stuff. And I, by the end, I was like, Dude, I have to, we have to, how do we do this? Like, let's make, let's do, we should make something. This is amazing. Like, that was a piece of content I would consume. And it reminded me of, do you guys, do you remember the old sketch, uh, Summoner Geeks, where it's like these, it's like these animated characters or these uh, video game characters playing D&D. And there's they like a the, big they go monster. The, they, go to the, they go to the kitchen. The kitchen. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. am I seeing this? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always love that. And I, I saw that back when people were talking about machinima, right? Like, and I remember, you know, doing things and being like, I think I could get this machinima thing. But then it's so complicated. It's like, I'm not going to animate machinima. Like, that's not going to be a thing. But then when Flipside came along and I was like, oh, I get it. It's machinima. It's Star Trek Bridge Commander. But it also gives us all these production tools that we can understand because we know how production works. It just all came together. And the other companies do other things, right? Like, you know, Face Rig is great if you're just going to do an avatar, an animated avatar, right? And even like um, Adobe just has, I can't remember what it's called, like Character Creator or something like that. Character Creator, yeah. 
yeah, awesome. You need to know a little bit more about animation than just put on a headset and you can see the person that you're interacting with and having a scene. So to me, it just was the one, the one tool that really did everything, you know, and then stuff that we didn't even know it could do. I mean, honestly, there, we were doing stuff with like sweeping camera moves and racking focus. And like, I mean, they were doing stuff in that room that I, even I was like, I, this is blowing my mind guys. You know what I mean? And, and that was, and they were pushing us and then we were and that back and forth. So it was, yeah. it was, it was very cool. And I, I, under, and actually when you explain kind of how you came to this, it actually really validates, you know, where we were coming from as a, as a company too, because so we come from, so like my background, improv theater, and I saw the yep. stage as being really important. Right. And yep. then, and then, I have a television diploma background. I had a diploma on uh, radio and television broadcasting. And so, so you know, all the tools that you I, need, you yeah. know, the tools, you learn the tools <laughs> yeah. and you're like, okay, this all makes sense. And then you got this thing, this game engine and you're like, oh yeah, this thing does anything, <laughs> you know, yep. and you start seeing that overlap. And so what was really inspiring about working with your team is that you guys just got it after after enough playing and yeah. once you are working with somebody who gets it uh you really really can experiment and that was one of the coolest aspects of of exploring the whole project all these projects with you one of the things i want to ask you about is we've talked about live from the eighth dimension which yeah you know it has its own it, it, you know we could talk about that for a while and but one of the other things i want to talk about is um you know, like what have you been making in Flipside Studio after <laughs> Live from the Eighth Dimension? And can you talk a little bit about some of yeah. something I call like a hybrid show? I, I, I see that you're really bringing another twist on everything. Oh, man. I <clears throat> With Live from the Eighth, we use the software, I would say, as intended, right? Um, building cool animated experiences, right? Like characters and, you know, characters interacting and in, in sort of virtual environments and stuff like that. Well, when Live from the Eighth, um, you know, was was put out to pasture, uh, as, as all good content is, right? And there's no, no harm, no foul. It's part of the, part of the business. Um, I was really cautious because I knew that we had built this team that were basically experts at Flipside. And, and I did not want to let them go out into the marketplace, right? So I was like, we're going to keep you and you guys just do weird stuff. You know what I mean? Like that's, that, at the time, that's all I had. I was like, just don't go anywhere. You know what I mean? Like keep experimenting um, and doing cool stuff. And then we'll figure out how we make it fit with, with what's going on. And it was right after um, – the COVID uh, uh, of it all started happening and, and physical production wasn't going to be able to be done in any meaningful way um, for the foreseeable future. And, and so we had to, our, one of our, our big flag flagship shows is the dungeon run, which does um, uh, it's a live tabletop uh, fantasy uh, improv fantasy narrative experience. That's a weird way to say, it. but anyway, one of the things that we pride ourselves on with um, with the dungeon run was the production value. So we basically went, let's make the best version of uh, a tabletop RPG experience. So we had massive set. We had an animatronic puppet as the host. We had, they, we, you know, our production design team, the Greg Aronowitz and his team would like build these amazing, elaborate Dungeons and Dragons models that, you know, and minis and everything was just like, you know, we had a jib, like multiple cameras. It, you know, it, it was like, that's how you do D and D, right? And then it was like, oh, we can't do D and D together. And so we were like, oh crap, okay. So we um, took a week off and did a watch with of, of the team, which was great. Um, and then we were like, you know, let's try to play D and D, right? And it was like, okay. And at the time, what the Oddly, because Amy uh, from Life in the Eighth Dimension is a D and D person. She has played D and D forever and DMs professionally, um, and so they were like, you know what? Let's. I think we can just make the studio in Flipside, and they can just play D and D in Flipside. And how fun would that be? And we were like, oh, okay. So they did this test where they got. Um, the, the Life in the Eighth team, uh, Amy and Roach, and they basically got together and they 
had Amy walk them through playing D&D. They used like dice that they could roll on the table. They were in characters, you know what I mean? Like, and, and from that test, we were like, well, I don't know if like, we don't necessarily want to watch that show. However, comma, what if we gave you the maps that we would go, like we would get these digital, beautiful digital maps and then print them, right? And then put them on the table and move minis around. And we were like, what if we put that digital map on the virtual table and then you put minis on the table and then you have one of the people just move the minis as the thing. And that concept has evolved into some of the most amazing Dungeons and Dragons playing that has ever been put to tape. I mean, honestly, we every single week when we use the map room, constantly being asked what software we're using, how can I do this myself? And I'm like, man, there are five people making this happen. <laughs> like, it's not like, you know, I was like, it's, and every time I'm like, it's flip side, good luck. It's not, you know, this is not designed for what we are doing, but we've really pushed the boundaries again with what they can do with miniatures. And because it's a, because it's a game engine, right? We're bringing in video game assets. So now the miniatures have animation cycles, um, we hired this really amazing, talented um, artist named Thomas, who's just bringing his A game with creating the virtual environments. And like, they literally did this episode where it was called The Descent, and they basically were supposed to be just going down. And, you know, we had a map, and it looked kind of like a cliff face, you know what I mean? And Thomas was like, I think I can do something here. And he built a giant, like, rock wall, waterfall with different like areas and we've i mean it's crazy and they do all of it live and in real time i mean it, it and and the way that they communicate with the cast because of the low latency is they're just watching the show mm. so literally the map room is just in vr waiting and then they go um okay can i go i'm gonna you know take me 30 30 feet this way you know left and the person just picks it up as they're saying and moves them left. And then they'll be like, oh, can I go one more space, uh, one space back? Boop, moves it back. And it's just like, it's mind blowing if you haven't seen it. It's like, you know, it, it, it really is. And again, all of that is because we had the talent that had been using the, the flip side software for o over a year. Plus the concept of we need to do this show remotely. So on that show, we have at least three internal caffeine streams that are hidden. So we have Map Room is, is streaming itself out. So basically, ma the Map Room is its own stream. They're cutting cameras. They're doing camera moves. I mean, it is it is what they have been able to do with that software for D and D is I mean, honestly, next 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 level stuff. And then we have our animatronic puppet still. He's just at a secure location, uh, AKA his apartment. Um, and, and then we have the live music that is being streamed uh, in real time. And all of it is people just watching the show and then changing, like the music is a perfect example. They watch the show and then literally we'll just pull the music out as the show is going on, change it and then slowly pull the music back up. And all of that is because of what we can do with caffeine. But honestly, I don't even know what we would do if we hadn't had flip side to do the map room. Cause it's just like, we were like, we were like, maybe we send Jeff like maps and a couple cameras. And it was just like, boy, that's going to look really bad. But what honestly now I've even said this uh, to our team, I don't know how we go back into a studio and not bring flip side with us. And honestly, we're thinking about like, do we do an LED screen inside the table? So the, the players are, are not moving their, their maps, but they're looking at the table and they're seeing the map room in the table uh, because it is so powerful to be able to, to do what they do with that software. I mean, it, it honestly, it's, it's better than what we do in the studio. And we were doing the top that I thought we could possibly do. What I love about the Dungeon Run stuff that you're doing is is you look at it and you as as a viewer you look at it and you go you know that somebody is is behind yeah. the scenes doing something right because yeah because yeah. you can see 
the performers are performing something and they'll, they'll give an instruction, you know, into the ether, it sounds like, you know, yeah. and the map is reacting. And, and so I, I, of course, we know somebody is in ghost mode or in that hidden mode and they have the mm -hmm. ability to grab all these virtual objects and move them around. Um, but what's cool is how, how live that feels yeah. that it doesn't feel out of place. It's yeah. such a, it's a, it, it really, that's why I was asking like, I think you hit on something that we weren't even really looking at in ourselves is there are ways to bring in these, these, these real time animated components that are blended with live flat action. And yeah. I just love to see what you're experimenting with there. Cause you're really, and COVID is, is really the source of all this kind of, you know, all the creativity is coming out of the reality is that we need to figure out how to continue to make stuff while yeah. we're like trying to stay safe. And I don't think we, we would have landed on seeing such a cool use of Flipside Studio if, if we would this not have done it. All I, happened. I, yeah, right? I can tell you right now, we would never. There is no world in which we would have gotten to where we are with the map room and and Flipside without us having to solve the problem of okay, these six people cannot sit next to each other today, and we want to make a show, right? Like <laughs> it all came from we still want to make a show, uh, but we cannot physically be in the same room together. Um, you know, and also like other other teams have um, have overcome it in different ways. You know, like I, I know Critical Role is back to production on on their show, and they're doing it in sort of like these pods. So they have a big open space, and each person has their own like little pod with a camera and mics and all that stuff. And and for us, it's like, well, as far as we're concerned, like we might as well just do it from home and you know using you know Zoom or whatever. Um, because if you're not going to be able to be able to like tactilely like be there with people and also, you know, it's still happening. Like we are still in a pandemic. So it's like every time you put people in the same room, you do run that risk, right. Of having to make sure that everything's on, everything's tightened up. Every, all, all the camera people have their masks on everything, you know, whereas I don't know if the, if the up value is going to be there, if we go back to that situation. And again, it was literally just, can you guys do something with the flip side software and, and map room? And I, you know, credit to the team, all credit to the team. They were the ones that were like, yeah, yes, we think we can do this. And they're the ones that have solved all the issues that have popped up, you know what I mean? And figured out how to make it happen. And, you know, like any, like anything, everything is, you know, anything that has to do with electronics is, is finicky. Right. And so we, you know, knock on wood, we went, however many episodes of however many hours you know 48 hours of using the software live in front of people and it never i think only once one time one time did we have to go to the backup which, which by the was, way the backup was flip side right like it's not like we went you cut to a camera of a live person doing something it's like no our backup was flip side another thing it was a stick man um, character and he was stick man uh, character and you know, he needed was, a vamp for like five minutes while they it was, rebooted <clears throat> it, was, it was awesome um i guess uh, to end this interview you know because yeah. we're, we're kind of talking about really we're talking about um like innovating in, in a crazy time and yeah. and which usually i think big technological leaps and ideas happen when people are constrained yeah. I'm I'm curious what you think about what does the next like decade look like in virtual production? Like how is the how is the world of production being flipped on its itself? I mean, I've been a huge fan of uh, you know, coming from a tech background and being a creative in the entertainment industry, technology and how you can use technology to create stuff has always been something that I've been a fan of and, and followed quite closely. Um, you know, I had met with um, a, a team of people that created essentially um, a virtual backgrounds using uh, LED panels and Unreal Engine. Um, it, you know, was taken to the nth degree with the Disney Plus series Mandalorian, which is really where everybody went Oh, this is a thing. Hello, VR or uh, LED, LED volumes. Nice to see you. You know what I mean? Uh, so I've been a fan of that concept of, of virtual productions. Um, but I think where where the real 
divergence is going to happen is, is that you don't necessarily need as many bodies to produce things today like you thought. Um, a perfect example is um, we have some, some friends that run an esports uh, company that does, they started as um, uh, using movie theaters to uh, have two esports teams compete against each other. And basically one of the teams was in Philadelphia. The other team was in Washington, DC, right? Fans of the Philadelphia team filled up the, you know, movie theater fans of the uh, DC team filled up their movie theater. Well, they then started to go, well, how the heck do we do that? Right. You've got cameras in DC and cameras in Philadelphia, but we want all of that stuff to come together to be cut together in a cohesive way. And so they designed this software that lives in the cloud that brings all the camera sources into the cloud. A, a technical director or TD sits wherever and just z like tunnels into the cloud and cuts the cameras. You can have a backup TD sitting over his shoulder. So if that uh, technical director's internet goes out, the thing is still in the cloud. So it's still streaming. It, the show is still going. And so that person can then just step in and start switching the cameras while that person is rebooting their router or whatever. I think there's a world in which that's going to happen more and more for stuff that you wouldn't necessarily need it to, because you can think about like, wait a minute, we can have a technical director that doesn't have to travel to Atlanta to do that show, right? They can stay in Los Angeles. They can do multiple shows over the course of a day or multiple shows, you know, back to back. And we don't have to pay for them to travel. We don't have to pay, you know, the director can be sitting at his house and seeing all the monitors and talking with everybody that was there. And why does that person have to be on set to go tell the, because for the most part, if you're in a control room, you're not, you don't go out to tell the, the camera operator that to change the shot, you press a button and you say, Hey, Bill, change the shot, you know, tighten that shot up a little bit. Okay, good. Let's take that shot. Right. I mean, it's like, that could be a truck in the back of the, of the place that you're doing it. Or it could be the dude's house or the, or the lady's house, right? So I think that there are things like that that are going to fundamentally change uh, the, way that, the way that we do it. And, and I think that, you know, I was just talking to a, a buddy of mine today about, about work from home, from offices. And he said, you know, what this has shown us is that if you are a person who works from home, you are not a second-class citizen. Prior to this in business, you're either in the office or you're a second class citizen, you know what I mean? And now it's like, oh no, that's not true. You can be as good as the next person while still doing this remotely. And, and I think that that's gonna start to happen. It's not gonna be this whole thing of like, well, why would we have the director at home? That feels like wrong. Now it's like, no, it works perfectly fine. And by the way, you can get a better director, right? Like, because you can pay, you know, take his, two days on either side or her two days on either side travel plus per diem plus hotel, you know, plus, you know, the cost of the flight and cut that in half and just pay that person that you're going to get a better quality of work. Right. So yeah. I think that's going to happen. And I think, you know, I think all of this, the virtual production stuff with, you know, um, virtual characters interacting with real life characters in real time, all that, you know, is going to be really next, next level stuff. I think all of the virtual production background stuff, there's sort of different modes of doing it. You know, there's the led walls, then there's the real time comping, um, you know, and then there's real time comping allows you to have interactive elements inside the space that could be powered by something like Flipside, Right. And so, you know, that's, that's all been stuff that's, that's been really exciting uh, for us to see, or for me to see personally. And I think in 10 years, it's going to look completely different. I think green screen's probably going to go the way of the Dodo. Um, just because again, it's like flip side where we had this opportunity to be able to go. Now nah, we don't like that. Let's do it. Let's try it the other way. You know, with green screen, you get what you get. And then you, all you can do is make stuff that goes into the green screen, but you're, you're, you know, all the camera angles are the camera angles, whatever you got on the day, you know, and just reference photos and all that stuff with led walls. And even with real time comping, you don't have to worry about that. You can try things out and go, Oh yeah, I don't really like that. Well, let's just move. I mean, with the led walls, it's crazy. You can just be like, uh, just rotate the world 180 degrees. And then we're going to get the other side. It's like, okay. Whoop, you know what I mean? So changes location scouting. 
Oh, well, big time. I mean, the whole idea of physical space is in question, I'd say. Like, I think you're really challenging the idea of like having a central physical space. Yeah. And, and, and the fact that if you combine everyone's apartments or houses or homes together, you actually have that space, but it's distributed across all these people's yeah. homes, you know? And uh, it's cool. It's cool to see that. It's cool. It's cool that you spend some time sharing your experiences with us. Oh, and dude, anytime, man. I, uh, Seriously, without that software, we would not have made half the stuff that we've made. 